computer history is fascinating. Even though the part about desktop computers isn't older than about 40 years, it contains a lot of interesting twists and turns. There are a few distinct eras, each with their special characteristic. However, not every period is equally interesting. The latest period, lasting from about 2003 until present day, is characterized by scaling. Scaling the already existing. There is more of everything and everything becomes bigger. The disks and memories are larger and faster and the CPUs have more cores than ever, packing insane compute power. Processors have billions and billions of transistors, enormous caches. Did you know that the i7-5960 has 20 megabytes of cache? So it's all about size. Maybe this is the Texas period of the desktop computing. But the market is completely dominated by Windows and Intel and almost everything is standardized and interoperable. Standards are good and everything, but it's kind of boring. The only thing that hasn't increased during the Texas era is the CPU clock frequency. It reached its maximum in about 2003 and then it flattened out at around 3 GHz. This is radically different from the previous time period from about 94 to 03. And that period saw an unprecedented rate of frequency increase. During these years the clock frequency increased by a factor of more than 40 in just 9 years. AMD and Intel were going head to head in a battle to first reach the magic 1 GHz limit. And as I recall it, AMD actually won that race in 2000 with their Athlon. But even if there were some action between Intel and AMD during this drag race period, the PC mass market more or less had consolidated around Intel solutions, and therefore this period isn't all that interesting either. The Windows PC just became faster by turning up the clock speeds. If one looks at the time period before 94, then it really starts to get interesting. At that time there were lots of actors on the desktop market besides the ones that we have today. Not only Commodore, Atari and Sinclair, but also Acorn, Spectra Video and Sharp. Even BBC had a microcomputer. And we shouldn't forget the initiatives behind the Iron Curtain. This period showed a much larger diversity in the solutions than any of the later periods. The OEMs chose different operating systems and different processor families. It was during this period the fanboys of Motorola and Intel fought over which processor was the better. The 486 or the 68040. This is also known as the home computer period and it can be divided into three sub-periods. The 32-bit period from approximately 90 to 94, which contained the high-end computers like the Atari Falcon, the Amiga 3000, 4000 and other similar machines. Then we have the 16-bit period, starting in about 84, which were to a large extent populated by 68,000 based machines, like the Macintosh, Amiga 1000 and Atari ST. Prior to that, there was the 8-bit period, which contained the iconic machines like the Commodore 64 and the Atari 800. It is not completely correct to say that these sub-periods have sharp boundaries. In fact, the Commodore 64 was manufactured right up to the demise of Commodore in April 94. This home computer period was certainly an interesting one, with lots of competitors and different initiatives. It saw a tremendous development in storage technology, graphics and sound. But when did this period really start? Which was the first desktop computer? If you think about home computers in its usual form from the 80s, that is with TV connectivity, keyboard, cassette storage and so on, many would argue that the Apple II from June of 77 would be the first. But if we relax the requirements a bit, we find other contenders, like the IMSI 8080 from December of 75. IMSI was actually a copy of the Altair 8800, which came out already in January 1975. But what about the brown box? It was there already in 1967. That is true, it came out long before the Altair, and it was the first one, as far as I can tell. But it was not a desktop computer, more like a game console. Because it was designed to run hardware games, it doesn't quite fit the bill as a general purpose computer, even though it could be placed on a desk. So I consider the Altair to be the first commercially available general purpose desktop computer. It was actually pretty fast. It ran at 2 MHz, which is twice the speed of Commodore 64, 
but it had only 256 bytes of RAM in its standard configuration. Compare that i7-5960, which I mentioned before. It had 20 megabytes of on-chip cache. So that is almost 100,000 times more cache in that processor than the Altair had for its entire system RAM. It was designed around the Intel 8080 processor, and even if it was clocked pretty fast for its day, its total compute power was only one millionth compared to our reference, the i7. It had only 0.27 dmips compared to the quarter of a million that the i7 has. The Altair was pretty primitive. In its simplest form it had no I.O., no mouse, no keyboard, no video, no audio, and no storage media of any kind. The only thing you could do was to program it by flipping the switches that were on the front panel, and the only way to observe the results was to look at the LEDs. The front panel contains three major sets of LEDs. There is the 8-bit data bus, the 16-bit address bus, and the status and miscellaneous LEDs. There are 16 switches for combined address and data input, and a set of switches for computer control like run, stop, examine, deposit, and reset. For a more complete description of how these switches work, see the front panel introduction video provided as a link below. It was possible to add expansion cards to the Altair. The expansion card bus was called S100 and was based on a card edge connector. The right and left sides of the expansion card was guided by PCB rails. But there were no connectors dedicated to each card through which it could reach the outside world. One could use some openings in the back plate, but it was up to the owner to make sense of what went where. Although the Altair was really cool for enthusiasts, I think several things could have been done differently to better cater the needs of its intended audience. An audience which I suspect contains nerds and geeks and early adopters and tinkering people. I'm not only thinking about the expansion board concept, but also about its economics, its capabilities, ergonomics, modularity, and so on. So let's do some counterfactual retro computer engineering. What would this computer look like if some circumstances were different and some key design decisions were changed? I intend to change the following circumstances. The Intel 8080 was introduced on the market in 1974, priced at $360. Motorola had their competitor, the 6800, on the market at the same time and at the same price. One of the designers of the 6800, Chuck Peddle, recognized the market opportunity for a simple processor in the $25 range. However, the management of Motorola didn't agree, so Peddle left Motorola for Moon's technology, where he created the 6502 series of processors. The 6502 entered the market in 1975 and was introduced at almost the intended price. Not only was the 6502 quite a bit cheaper, it was much faster too. Judging by the DMIPS numbers, the 6502 did almost three and a half times more work per clock cycle. MITS, the makers of the Altair, chose Intel 8080 probably due to the market availability at the time of the construction of the Altair in 1974. If Chuck Peddle would have left Motorola a little bit earlier, the Altair might have had a 6502 instead and would therefore be a lot cheaper. I would have taken some of that saved cost and invested in more memory. And if the memories in the 70s were a bit cheaper, we could have ended up with a lot more than just 256 bytes. This is something I would like to change as well. Another way to reduce the cost of the Altair, at least when sold to hobbyists, would be to not only sell it as a kit, but actually let the customers manufacture some parts themselves by using 3D printer technology. Sadly, there were no 3D printers available in the 70s. I'd like to change that also. Apart from changing some circumstances, I intend to change the following design decisions. I want to make the front panel more flexible, that is, mechanically reconfigurable and ergonomic. I want to make it cheap and easy for hobbyists to make their own expansion boards, to test them, install them and write software for them. I also want to make the back panel slotted like on modern computers. I want to improve the user interface in several different ways. Today on the Altair you can step the clock in single steps, but I want to have single instruction stepping as well, and I want to separate the data from the address switches, and I want to improve the user control over the clock generation. 
Other than that, we'll stick with the 70s garage circumstances. No SMD, no high-speed oscilloscopes or advanced logic analyzers, no PLDs, no FPGAs, no fast computers to do electronics designs on. Well, those are the circumstances, but maybe we have to cheat a little bit here or there. So, in the coming episodes, we will design this computer from scratch. Make the breadboard designs, verify it, make the housing by using a 3D printer, design the different PCBs and send them off to manufacturing, solder and mount the components, and finally, we should be able to compile and test everything. Hopefully we've created the hobbyist dream of a retro-engineered 70s machine. In the next episode we will go into the architecture. How do we divide and conquer this problem? See you next time!